Hello world, I'm Benjamin. Welcome back to Source Decoded and welcome to this supplemental installment of JavaScript is Easy in which we will discuss one of the things that makes JavaScript kind of not easy sometimes. But this thing we're going to cover is one of the wartiest of the warts and once you make it through this with some easy to follow advice uh, you'll be back on track and it should be pretty much smooth sailing. So why don't we just start with the easy to follow advice. In the last video, I introduced you to the equality and inequality operators. And the easy to follow advice is this, um, don't use those. Instead, you should use the newer, improved, strict equality and strict inequality operators. Basically, the strict versions do what the plain ones do, except they do it in a way that makes more sense and works more like most people expect them to. Now, if you don't care about what that means, I guess you can go on and watch a video of a meerkat or something. But if you want to understand what's actually going on and maybe learn the lesson of the parable of the zombie operators, then stick around. When JavaScript was first designed, one of the design goals was that it should be really accessible, easy for people to get into who are maybe not computer science majors, don't have a lot of experience with programming. It was also created under a very tight deadline. Uh, Brendan Eich, the creator of JavaScript, famously wrote the first version in about 10 days while he was working for Netscape. And I should say, we're going to sling a little bit of mud on the equality and inequality operators. That is not a reflection on Brendan Eich. He's one of my nerd heroes and by all accounts is a genius. But he was working under some pretty intense pressure and this design goal of making it accessible and this tight time pressure maybe didn't give him the time that he needed to think about what the consequences of some of these design decisions were going to be. So to understand this specific decision that was made, let's go back and pretend it's 1996 and uh, you're a web developer. This profession is brand new and the web is pretty static at this point. Web pages don't do much. And the goal of JavaScript was to make it possible for web pages to do some interesting things. At one point it was called DHTML, dynamic HTML. So let's say you want to build a simple number guessing game, like pick a number between one and 10 or whatever. On your page, you're going to have a, an input box and a button, and the user is going to type a number in the input box and click the button. And then your program is going to say whether their guess was too high, too low, or right on. So right away, we can see that in this program, there's going to be some comparing going on, right? We have to compare the number that was entered against the random number that the program came up with. Well, when we ask that input box for its value or what the user typed in, we're going to get that back as a string, not a number. In HTML, pretty much everything is strings. So the designers of JavaScript had to make a choice. We know that JavaScript users are going to have to compare strings with numbers quite a lot. Should we make that easier? Now, virtually every programming language has an equality operator that compares two values and tells you if they're the same. And in most other programming languages, if you compare a string with a number, it doesn't matter what the values of those things are. But if you compare two things of different type, it's going to say it's not the same. A string is not the same as a number. A Boolean is not the same as an object. But what was decided with JavaScript was in order to make it easier, we'll help you out a little bit. If you compare a string five with a number five, we know what you mean, so we're gonna say yes, those two things are equal. The language is trying to save you, the programmer, from the burden of having to worry about types, of converting strings to numbers and numbers to strings and things like that. And in the beginning, maybe this seemed like a good idea, but as JavaScript grew up, we began to realize that this was not a good idea. It was actually a bad idea because you, the programmer, do care about the differences between types. A string five is not a number five. They are two different things. So the language trying to be helpful ended up making a lot of extra work for the programmers in certain cases. They had to write around this feature of the language. If you cared about the difference between types, you had to do extra work to check the types before you did the comparison with the equality operator. 
Now, recognizing that this was a problem, when JavaScript began to be standardized, they added an operator, the strict equality. Well, actually, they added two operators, the strict equality and the strict inequality operator. The strict equality operator cares about types. If you give it two values of different types, you'll always get false back. So why didn't they just fix the double equals? Why did they add this triple equals that we see in like no other programming languages? Well, herein is the parable of the zombie operator. As Brendan Eich himself said, once something is released into the wild, bugs or imperfections quickly become essential features and are nearly impossible to change. So put yourself back in the late 90s. The browser wars are in full swing. Netscape has dominance, but Microsoft is coming along playing really hard with Internet Explorer. And Microsoft has reverse engineered your JavaScript implementation, they called it JScript, so that these fancy new dynamic web pages that worked in Netscape now also work in Internet Explorer. If you're Netscape and you decide to fix this bug of the equality operator, Overnight, there's going to be a whole bunch of web pages that all of a sudden don't work in Netscape, but they will still work in Internet Explorer. And you can see why that might be a problem. So be careful how you design things. Not everything that you design will last forever, but something you design badly could stick around and turn into a zombie that follows you around trying to eat your brains, or at least consume your brain capacity with its bad implementation. So in JavaScript today, we have these two zombie operators, the double equals and the not equals. And we can't get rid of them because software on the internet is written to use them. So for new JavaScript developers like you, we just say, don't use them. Use the triple equals and the not double equals instead. Your life will be happier and your programs will be easier to understand. But let's not leave it there. Let's actually look inside of these operators and see what they actually do. We'll start with the triple equals, the strict equality operator. So triple equals will take two values. If the two values are of different types, it will return false. If one of the values is a nan or not a number, then return false. Nan is never equal to anything, even a nan. Finally, if the two values are the same, then return true, otherwise return false. Now, there's some differences in how we determine sameness between the different types, like numbers and strings, but we won't go into that right now. It works pretty much the way you would expect. 5 equals 5, string 5 equals string 5. 5 does not equal string 5. That's pretty simple. There's really only one special case in there, and that's the case around the NAN. Now, let's talk about the original equality operator, the double equals. And I'm going to need to look at notes for this one. Double equals takes two values. If the two values are the same type, then it works the same as the triple equals. If one value is null and the other is undefined, then return true. Null and undefined are two special types that we haven't talked about yet. If one of the values is a string and the other is a number, convert the string to a number and then run the algorithm again. So we're going to turn that string into a number and then we're going to start over at the top and work through all of these rules again. If one of the values is a boolean, then convert that boolean into a number and then run the algorithm again. A true will become a one and a false will become a zero. And then there's one more rule regarding what you do if one of the values is a primitive type, like a string or a number, and the other value is an object. We won't dig into that one just yet. And finally, if none of the other rules have applied, return false. Now you see how complicated that is? There's a special rule about numbers and strings. There's a special rule about null and undefined, another one about Booleans, and another one about primitives and objects, plus the one about not a number that we inherited from the triple equals. That's five special rules. And you as the programmer, if you're going to use this feature of the language responsibly, you should understand all five of those things. Most people, however, don't. They don't know what's going on inside the double equals, so when they use it, they get unpredictable results. That's why we say not to use it. Just pretend that it's not there. Okay, now to wrap this up, I thought maybe we should have a little fun with the double equals operator to just kind of drive home this point that we're making. So let's go down to the JavaScript console and see how many things we can make appear to be equal, even though maybe they shouldn't be. All right, let's start out with the string and the number case that we talked about. 
string five and number five is true. Now we know that what's going on is that the string is being converted into a number. So if we say 005.00, that's gonna get turned into a number and still be equal to five. And it doesn't matter how many zeros we pad this with on either end, it will still be equal to five. We get true back. Turns out JavaScript has more than one way of writing a number, so this works too. A string 0x8 equals 8. Uh, the 0x8 is notation for how to write a hexadecimal number in JavaScript. And this method has some, some siblings. We can say 0xb equals 11 because b in hexadecimal is 11 in decimal. And why not stop there? Let's figure out what is 11 in binary? Oh, it's three in decimal. And we can also do octal. So zero, O, oh, 10 is the same as saying nine. Whoops, it doesn't equal nine, it equals eight. 10 in octal is eight, that's right. Okay, now remember that rule about converting Booleans to numbers. Let's exploit that. Uh, we should be able to see that a string zero equals false. Ah, true. And this is happening in multiple steps. The first thing that happens is that the false get turns into a number and then we rerun the algorithm. And now we have a string and a number. And so the string gets turned into a number and rerun the algorithm and finally we end up with true. Okay, we should mention the null and undefined. Is null the same as undefined? Yes, it is. And uh, to round it out, we'll exploit that last rule that we didn't really talk about. This is an object in JavaScript, it's just an empty object. We should be able to say that that is equal to, oh, I need to wrap that in parentheses to make the parser happy but an empty object is equal to object. And then finally, there are lots of ways to convert objects into primitive values. So uh, this works too. Let's make an array b3, and we ought to be able to see that that is equal to one b3. And it is. So now you know more about these equality operators than most people writing JavaScript today, and even more than I knew about them a week ago. In researching for this video, I ended up going to the spec to read how it actually works because I really wanted to understand. But I think that knowing the history of where these things came from actually makes it make more sense. Not that I will use the original equality operator, but it explains kind of the philosophy that backed JavaScript in the first place and helps me understand why things are the way they are. Some of these rules about converting strings to numbers for the sake of comparison actually apply to other operators too, like greater than or less than. That just happens to bite us a little less frequently. The next video will be back to our normal programming and we'll learn some things that allow us to make our programs a little more interesting. That's all for now. You'll see me in the next one.